Hi, this is Raghu Marcus and uh, another episode of Mind Rolling. And I just uh, a little bit of an intro to today's uh, session chat, which is with uh, Sharon Salzberg. And Sharon is a long, long time friend of mine and has been a teacher of mine and is someone I have uh, the highest regard for as a human being and as a teacher. And uh, I think many of you already know that because Sharon has been with me on numerous occasions doing these podcasts or live podcasts from ABC that we did just recently at the end of last year. And I want to give a little bit of a heads up for those of you who are on the West Coast, and of course you can travel from anywhere in the world to this, but Sharon is doing a retreat on March 16th through 18th. This is 2018, and it's amidst the scenic California Redwoods, just a beautiful spot near Santa Cruz at 1440 uh, University. University? Uh, it is a brand multiversity, not Una. Una would be one multi in that they have so many uh, distinctive um, possibilities that you can take part in when you go there and do this retreat. And uh, it's uh, it's just a wonderful new retreat destination, and I highly recommend that you take the opportunity to go out there, especially with Sharon being there. And uh, again, on March 16th through 18th, 1440 is, as you well know, any of you who have been listening loyally to not just Mind Rolling, but all the other podcasts on BeHereNowNetwork.com. And uh, 1440 Multiversity has been a... uh, a loyal sponsor now for a number of months, and through their generosity, we're able to put all of these different podcasts together. There's a host of people that it takes to run the network and provide all of the content and create courses and so on and so forth. So please do give a little applause for 1440, because and what they are aligned with around mindfulness and neuroscience and relationships and the creative arts in in terms of the kinds of retreats that they present at 1440 is totally in alignment with our values at Be Here Now Network and Ram Dass's Love Serve Remember Foundation, which is the umbrella for Be Here Now Network and ramdass.org. And I also want to remind you, I don't know if I remember if I talked about Sharon's latest book called Real Love, The Art of Mindful Connection that we need a heck of a lot more focus on in our current state of affairs. So here it is, a wonderful chat with Sharon around our newest subject that I'm trying to get her to write a book about called Getting Real. How do we get real in our practice, in our lives? And we also talk a lot about my latest favorite subject, which I've been talking about with many of my old friends and teachers, Joseph Goldstein and Jack Cornfield and Lama Surya Das, and I'll be talking to Roshi Halifax, Joan Halifax. And it's around the wisdom of karma, but not that esoteric thing, well, not the, the everyone uh, thinks of uh, of cause and effect, which karma is, but there's so many subtleties and so many ways that we can bring uh, real mindfulness of our the karma that we create and and how that affects us in our day to day lives, of course, uh, and in our future lives. Uh, so I've been investigating that subject, and Sharon and I talk about that as well. So here it is, and don't forget again. Uh, 1440 Multiversity, way better than University, and uh, March 16th through 18th. See you soon. Hi, everyone. It's Mind Rolling, and I'm back with my dearest 
oldest, one of my oldest, dearest friends. She is a dear, Sharon Salzberg. Sharon, welcome. So glad to see you. I'm so glad to see you. So, by the way, everybody, I haven't said one word to Sharon about what the heck I want to talk about, which is the beauty of hanging out with Sharon. Uh, but um, it's been on my mind, Sharon, that uh, that whole thing, which we've had a continuing conversation about when Duncan Trussell said to you, what do you do in your practice? And you, say, you said to him, it's simple. I sit down and I get real, Duncan. <laughs> and so we've had an ongoing thing about what does that really mean? And in fact, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Sharon and I and Duncan and Ethan Nickter and David Silver, we did a thing recently in November at uh, Deepak Chopra Theater at ABC Carpet. And, uh, and we, uh, Sharon, you renamed it. I don't know if you remember. Well, I don't think we should talk about get real getting real because it is a process mm -hmm. and i picked up some of the things from there that we talked about uh in terms of what does that mean you know s seeing the difference between our actual experience and the story we tell ourselves which is uh, extraordinarily important um and uh, and how do we get through an unadorned get to an unadorned experience not having to defend it or explain it Mm -hmm. or compare it and I also uh, I like to think that how do we remove the manipulations that we do in our minds that uh, to to create the most pleasurable agreeable experience possible for our little me's uh, and you know and of course dealing with fear and, and judgment again which mm -hmm. pulls us away from being able to, to be here so, yeah, just talk, let's just go over that a little bit again, especially the unadorned experience mm -hmm, part, mm -hmm. if you can talk about that. Well, actually, what came up in my mind was, uh, you know, I've sat in the past, as has uh, Joseph, you know, people like that, with this Burmese teacher, um, Saida Upandita, and we first brought him to Barry, to the Insight Meditation Society, in uh, 1984, never having met him before but having heard he was a great teacher. So we brought him to teach this three month retreat and he was a great teacher. He was also like really tough and oh, yeah. fierce and intense and demanding. And um, we were meeting him six days a week for these individual meetings, which for some reason they called interviews just to describe our practice and to get some feedback from him. And uh, he had a kind of formula almost that he needed you to be expressing yourself in both so that he could get through the translator and so he could get the information he wanted. So that was like one kind of experience of he didn't want an interpretation. He didn't want a judgment. He didn't want you to walk in and say, I had a lousy morning. Cause what does that mean? You know, you fell asleep, you were jumping out of your skin with restlessness. You know, what does it mean? Uh, and if you did like one layer above just the direct data, you know, of your experience, he would call you on it. And until you got what he was going after, it was very confusing and frustrating. And why wouldn't he listen? And why can't I get through? But in the end, it was this amazing exercise just to say, this is what happened. Hmm. You know, because what you had to do at the time is say, this is what's happening, not like. I'm the best meditator that ever lived. I'm going to float in the air in a minute. Or I'm like the worst person who ever lived. Can you look at those reviling thoughts, you know? And, <laughs> um, it's just, this is what happened. This is my experience. Uh, and it was fabulous in the end. It was frustrating along the way, kind of picking it up. But it was really fabulous. And if you went in, and I had a friend, actually. I was sitting in, the, at that point, I was assisting. And I was sitting in the back of the room. And. This friend went in and she, she said, I have this amazing insight into impermanence. And he, he was a little hard to understand, but he basically said, I don't want to hear your assessment. I want to hear what actually happened. Hmm. You know, so what he wanted to hear was something like, um, I moved my arm to get the teacup and the movement was broken up into like 50,000 little movements. And I saw, wow, everything is changing all the time. Hmm. There's no solidity. 
he didn't want you to walk in there and say, wow, I saw that everything's changing all the time. So she freaked out and she wrote me a note and, and said, why didn't he believe me? It was a genuine oh. experience. I really had the understanding. And I wrote back and I said, he definitely believed you. It wasn't that, but this, this friend is a writer. And I said, you know, in writing, they always tell you show, don't tell. Like you can't have good writing if you say, oh, the doctor came into the room very nervous. You have to say the doctor came in, dropped everything, you know, was pale, you know, sweating or whatever. Uh, so it's kind of like that. And he always insisted, just say what happened, not the conclusion you drew from it. Just say what happened. And then she got it because she was a writer, you know, and and she went back and she could say whatever it was that led her to have that that thought that she'd had that realization, which she genuinely had had. And it was great training and just look at that. Look how much story there is usually in my every fabrication, you know, that um, this is going to last forever. I mean, you know, I'm alone with this. No one ever feels anything like this or, uh, you know, so much. And, and to be in a situation where you have to strip it away was a great benefit. Yeah, why are we, why is it so <laughs> difficult for us to just be simple? Why? Uh, I I don't get the whys that easily, you know. And, and I, this other teacher, Manindra, uh, mm. one of my earlier teachers, mm -hmm. he was always sort of trying to move us away from, uh, you could basically say from the why to the what, you know, because if you ask why, it's always going to involve a belief system. Like if you ask a Jungian therapist, they'll provide a certain answer. If you ask somebody else, they'll provide a very different kind of answer. And if that resonates with your own belief system, you think, oh, yeah, that's why. Uh, but yeah. it, it's not necessarily going to give you a greater skill on dealing with what actually is happening. Yeah, right. You know, right in the moment. Mm. The, the best example of that actually is in India, going to India with somebody who's never been there before. And they're just looking around because everything is so completely bizarre and upside down. You can't imagine yeah. why. Why are they do? And they, why? And and the standard mantra is, you don't ask why yeah, while you're in good. India. <laughs> yeah. You just don't yeah. because you're never going to get a, an answer. Yeah. It's not possible. Yeah. It's beyond rational mind. So I guess yeah. that's the answer for for us. But I think also what I'm really talking about is, the level of attachment that we have to our process, thought processes yeah. and the outcome of them and the projection of them. And that's, yeah. that to yeah. me is, if we can get behind that in terms of, that's getting real. And, I, yeah. and, that, and that that's exactly real. what uh, your teacher was, was pushing to, yeah. pushing these people to. So that's pretty fantastic. Um, well, we don't often, you know, have a sense of the relativity of things. We have to kind of, and it's useful to step back, I think, and just take a look and realize um, you know, you might not have had much sleep and your shoulder hurts and you're in a bad mood and, you know, and you have a certain kind of thought and you take it to heart and it feels like it's really you and it's the only thing you'll ever feel. And, you know, and you might have that identical thought another day when you've had a good night's sleep and, right. you know, your dogs have been like cuddling up for an hour and you're in a great mood and your shoulder feels good and you have the same thought and you go, oh, that's a funny thought. Yeah, you know, it's amazing. It is yeah. amazing, just the perspective shifts that happen, uh, and th and that's what we're talking about here is is to do whatever it is to cultivate and support those things which allow the perspective to be what what you just mentioned, which is more or less it's okay. Yeah. yeah. I, how did I get here? Uh, Ramdas yeah. is great. His line these days is when he has a weird thought or a negative thought, he goes, how did I get here? That's interesting. <laughs> yeah, so It is interesting. Yeah. How did I end up here? You know? yeah. <laughs> um, so in thinking more uh, about the concept of getting real, then I started to think uh, yesterday when I was thinking about us chatting, I started to think about uh, the Noble Eightfold Path of the Buddha and we we actually have done long time ago, Sharon. We did a podcast around the eight, eightfold path, and it was it was really fantastic. Those of you, you can look up uh, that uh, and on mind rolling because it's well worth it. So I don't want to get into too much of, of details of the stuff that we've already covered. But 
there in terms of of getting real i mean gee right understanding right thought right speed right action right livelihood right effort right mindfulness and right uh, concentration uh, what do we mean just in general by right in terms of getting real well you know it's interesting because a lot of uh kind of modern scholars they don't like the word right oh really? uh, because they, it brings up wrong. I like the word right because I think there is a wrong. Uh, you know, and so people try, I'm, maybe also people are trying to make it more palatable for listeners, you know, that like uh, it's balanced understanding, balanced thought. It's wise understanding, it's wise thought. Mm. I like right because I, I think there is a right and a wrong, you know. Mm. And um, that's not saying you're a bad person, you know, or I'm a bad person when I practice wrong speech, you know, for example, uh, but actions are consequential and, and the wrong, you know, is, is a matter of pain. It's not a matter of goodness, one's inherent goodness. When we do things or we cultivate traits or, uh, habits that cause more and more suffering to ourselves and to others, that there's a wrongness there, you know, that's, that's what makes it wrong. When we do things or we cultivate forces in our own minds that, um, bring us closer to uh, balance and harmony and love and uh, wisdom. There's a rightness there, you know. So that's what it really means. And and uh, I, you know, I think the Eightfold Path is is magnificent because there it is. You know, that's what we long for. It's like most of us, not everybody, perhaps, but most of us uh, would like to be more loving. For example. Mm. Um, like I have a friend who's British, he grew up in the Church of England, and he said from the time he was a kid, like nine years old, say, uh, when he would hear, love thy neighbor as thyself, he would just feel this thrill go through his whole body, and mm. he would be like in rapture. And then he said from the time he was about nine years old, he'd get into big trouble, because his question was always, well, how? We don't actually like our neighbor that much. <laughs> you know, like how? Or maybe we don't like ourselves that much. So the how is the point, you know, that these things can be real. You know, it's not just idealism or something you say on Sunday in church and you forget about the rest of the week. These things can be real. It can be how we live. But for most of us, there's a big how, you know. We have to look at what's holding us back. We have to look at the challenges or hindrances. We have to learn how to let go. We have to learn how to step forward into new terrain like being willing to experiment and, you know, maybe thank people we take for granted or be generous where we haven't been before, you know? So, so there's a lot of how to the how. Uh, and I find that amazing, you know, cause that's very reassuring instead of like, I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to live it. Yeah. How, which is a lot of what we're talking about here when we're talking about getting real and the how of it. Let's, let's take one, which is a very difficult thing for Westerners, right effort, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, because we are so oriented to success and goal-oriented, yeah. and, yeah. and we're going we're gonna to make this effort or else kind of a thing. Uh, so I think that there's a real, when we talk about right effort, uh, I think we, we need to really ad address the, to me, with practice, the equanimity that needs to be brought into the moment in regards to effort. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe just chat about that for a minute. Yeah, I mean, what I say now in my older years is, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> I think nothing in life is a straight shot. You know, like we want to learn something, we want to change something. It's going to mean going forward, falling down, picking yourself up, or letting others help you up and going forward again. So, any effort has to be wise, you know, it has to be intelligent. You know, I used to think with meditation, for example, like, okay, it's hard in the beginning, but I'm going to have the great breakthrough experience, and it will never be difficult again for a moment after that, you know, and that doesn't really happen. We go up, we go down, we keep going. And, um, you know, so then it does need, to, I mean, equanimity is, I think, exactly the right term. We do need a kind of equanimity. We need an understanding, like, yeah, we're going to be beginning again. We're going to blow it a lot. That's where self-compassion comes in. Um, you know, instead of spending the next year and a half blaming yourself for having blown it, for having your mind wander, you start over, you know. 
And uh, that's why we call meditation sometimes a practice of resilience because it teaches us that. And um, it's a very necessary part of things. Like I've heard, you know, in, in Buddhist teaching, we, we take um, voluntarily, we, we take certain precepts, you know, certain ethical uh, guidelines. We undertake them, you know, not to kill, not to steal, things like that. And, um, you know, I've heard people say, um, and some of them have to do with not lying, you know, speaking the truth and not lying and and so on. And I've heard people say, you know, I don't know what to do. I said the wrong thing. I really blew it. And, and you know, and they're asking some venerable teacher and they're like shaking because they're so upset. And, and the teacher just looks at them and says, well, then you need to take the precept again. Hmm. You know, it's not like penance or hellfire. It's like you have to start again. You know, lessons learned maybe, you know, or maybe there's. I guess some amends to be made sometimes, you know, but uh, definitely lessons learned and, and taking that knowledge. Oh, this really hurts. This feels crummy to have told that lie. And look how paranoid I am about being found out. And it's not really a good way to live. You know, we take that understanding into a resolve not to just be reckless again to the best of our ability. And, you know, so that that's kind of the tone of it. Hmm. And, um, Getting and everybody out there that's listening right now, uh, one of the great things that Sharon has uh, shared with us over the years and in the retreats and podcasts and so on is the universal truth of starting over. You can start again. That takes a lot of the bullshit out of feeling like, uh, uh, out of the projections, out of the manipulations. Out mm -hmm. of everything that we get stuck because we get stuck in our minds over these things. And that is what uh, is, it puts us on the continuum of being stuck. And which, so just the, the idea, everybody, we can start over at any one point, not just in a meditation practice when you know you're, you're lost in thought and you, you bring yourself, okay, start again. But when you go through these, in terms of all of the Eightfold Path about right understanding, thought, speech, and all of it, you can't start over once you realize that you mm -hmm. are not in sync with what, uh, with Dharma. And we'll mm -hmm. talk about that in a bit. Uh, and, and one of the other things here that I'd like to talk about here when we're talking about the Eightfold Path is, uh, and you just brought it up, and, and it's around ethics. And my understanding is that um, it's that what we're talking about, or what Buddha was talking about, uh, and the Buddhist teachings are talking about, is ethics is related to love and compassion. So that w what it is that we're it's so this isn't um, you're not in high school, and you know you can't get out of line because you get out of line, you're going to the principal's office. This. This is how we in the West interpret this kind, this word. Even. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So say a little bit about the reality of ethical conduct, Sheila, and, uh, and, and love and compassion, which is really the heart of what we're talking about. Well, I think the, um, the almost like the innermost layer of love and compassion is for ourselves. Mm. You know, that's the first reason we practice ethics is because it's a miserable mind state you know we don't always realize that but once you start looking within however you're practicing introspection uh you kind of see oh that stuff doesn't go away you know i'm still worried about that lie i told you know 15 years ago look at that i never knew and the it's just burdensome and you know the thought that we can say tell a lot of lies and then sit down on saturday and do a workshop to seek the truth and it's not going to be connected to our experience it's just not real. That's not real, you know, because our lives are of one piece. And so, um, you know, you sit down and you've, you know, done something kind of off, you know, that's really breaking the harmony or, or you've been deceitful in some way. And usually it comes up at some point or another. And so instead of sitting there feeling your breath or doing a mantra or whatever, you're thinking, did I lie to enough people? Maybe I have to lie to somebody else because I have to bolster that original lie. And, <laughs> okay. you know, maybe it wasn't convincing enough. Or, 
you know, what if they ever find out that I'm living, I'm not, by the way, living in an illegal sublet, <laughs> I'm living in a very legal sublet. But, you know, what if I had been, you know, what if I took up that offer and I, I took advantage of that opportunity that came and then I, you know, I'd be sitting here every day thinking, you know, was that a knock at the door? <laughs> they come to throw me out, or, you know? And so you realize there are consequences to where we, how we speak, you know, it's a very powerful form of being speech and there are consequences to our actions. And just out of the greatest kindness for yourself, you think, I don't think so. You know, like I don't need to just stay on this treadmill and, and keep perpetuating this really bad feeling. And, I'm going to try something else. And and that is very un-American in a way or un-Western because I think when we think of an adventure and being bold and, you know, we think of being more reckless. We don't think about being simpler, you know, or kinder or more truthful or something like that. So it's turning a lot around to, to think, well, what would it be like? Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Which which actually is uh, leads me to my n- next path with uh, this whole concept of getting real, which was as I was thinking about that, and I'd been talking to different friends of ours about it and so on. I also happened to do a uh, podcast with a a guy named Robert Svoboda. I, th- I think you might know who Robert is. He wrote those Agora books, and the last of them was called The Law of Karma. And we ended up talking about that extensively, and that just triggered me into really wanting to share that. And uh, in fact, uh, I found something that Joseph either, uh, he must have had a talk about it uh, at some point, and maybe it was transcribed, but I, f- I found this talk. Actually, I talked to Joseph about karma and so on, and getting real and before I found this particular uh, uh-huh. wonderful uh-huh. article but uh-huh. um, but you know when you start to talk about when we were just talking about and you were talking about ethics and and developing self-love self-compassion from which we can then make the right actions so then we start to talk about the results we talk about cause and effect and the results in uh, actions that we take that cause uh, and he says, um, by the way, the, the lead thing that triggered me that uh, uh, Robert quoted to me, which I've been quoting to other people, uh, is from the Bhagavad Gita. Krishna says, karma is the guru. Nay, it is the supreme Lord. That's from the Srimad Bhagavatam. And that triggered this whole thing of, wow, okay. We all need to be thinking a little bit more about what we are doing on a day-to-day basis. Talk about getting real. We really, Mm -hmm. after this conversation I had with Robert, you know, where we went into the the extraordinary subtleties of our actions and thoughts, never mind actions, I was like, oh, Jesus. (laughs) You know, it was like that moment when Ram Dass was in front of Neem Karoli Baba Maharaji and he realized he knew everything about him and could read everything, not just what he was thinking in that moment. And he went, holy shit, if he knows that, it was, oh, my God. you know. And then, of course, he was just this loving, unconditional love. Uh, but uh, in that moment, I didn't have that un- unconditional love for mm-hmm. myself. Mm-hmm. I was like, mm-hmm. um, but he says, karma, um, the seeds of karma shape our lives and our worlds. Though different Buddhist traditions give different weight to whether the action is willed or not. And that's where I really want to talk about that because that's really important. In either case, through mindfulness, we become aware of the nature of these actions and can, in fact, change our karma, the concept of cause and effect. Can you can you flesh out what he's talking about or what Buddha, Buddhists are talking about when you talk about whether the action is willed or not? I don't know exactly what he means by that, actually. Oh, really? Because the whole thing about karma, supposedly, as far as I understand, is is willed. Is that it's intent? I don't know about willed, but it's intent. It's the intention behind the act that forms the karmic seed. Mm. You know, so it's like I might give you a gift, I might give you a book, for example. But why is the question? You know, what's my motivation? Because so the the karma uh, the karma is not planted through the karma means seed. Karmic seed is not planted through the uh, my arm, you know, moving down and picking up an object and moving it forward. It's in the heart space 
that is spurring my arm to do that. You know, so maybe I'm offering you the book because I like you and I think you'll really enjoy it. Or maybe I'm offering you the book because I see you have this great water bottle or something. And I think, well, I'll give you the book. Maybe you'll give me that. Or maybe I'm giving you the book because I think, because I really don't like you. And I think, oh, as soon as you open it up, that first paragraph is going to really upset you. <laughs> you know, but it's like the same smile. It's the same gesture. So uh, it can't be the same karma. You know, it can't be in the arm. Uh, it has to be in the heart that is having my arm move forward. And so uh, they say also only we can know our own intention. It's like some people, I think, feel they're, maybe rightly so, they're very sensitive and they can kind of guess. But really only we can absolutely know our own intention. And so we use mindfulness to see where we're coming from. And we try to come from the best intention that we can. And, uh, you know, it also said that if you do loving kindness meditation, your whole field of intentionality will change. It will shift. So, if, for example, you've largely been coming from fear as a motivating force in what you do or what you say or what you hold back from doing or saying, and you do loving kindness, you'll find you're more and more coming from a place of connection. It's just the way it's happening. Um, that that's your whole motivational base has shifted. So I'm not exactly sure what Joseph meant. It's yeah. a good you should have us both on, and we can chat about it. Yeah. You know, what are you that talking we about? <laughs> we should do that. Well, I mean, we might have to wait till the retreat that we're all going to be at later this year. Um, but he also goes on to say, our direct awareness of how the karmic law is working in each moment can be a strong motivation to develop skillful states of mind that create happiness for us in the moment as well as the as produce the fruit of well-being in the future this is so all of this is so tied into this whole thing we've been talking about getting real to me mm -hmm. i mean so absolutely tied in you know because just the the awareness factor of of how uh the, the you just said it about the motivation that we all have and where does that motivation come from but at the same time i notice in myself a lot of times I have, I, I, there's an action and I'm aware of it and there's, uh, there, there's a good intention, say, to help somebody and yet there's an ulterior motive, either self-satisfaction or something else that is mixed in to that particular action. So it's mm -hmm. not all one thing. How, do you, how yeah. do you deal with that? Yeah, I mean, I think we do find a lot of mixed motives as we look within and you just do the best you can. I think you realize that um, each part of that is consequential. And, you know, the part that's really generous, for example, genuinely so has certain benefits and consequences. And, and the part that's showing off or wants to look like a certain kind of person that yeah. has certain consequences, too. And part of the consequences of that is a sort of paranoia, like, did they thank me enough? You know, maybe they like the other person's <laughs> book better, you know, and. Maybe they already had the book, and I'm so embarrassed, and I bet they already had the book, and they didn't want it to begin with, and, you know, and, like, oh, they think I'm just trying to push my own book, you know, whatever. You know, it, these things just are consequential, and we do them, so we might as well learn from them by paying attention, you know, and you see, oh, that really made a difference. You know, I thought it was nothing just to, um, you know, yell at that person on the subway or, or send that email. I thought it was like a nothing act, but look at this 18 hours later, it comes back, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's right back in my mind. Like, where's that been lurking? <laughs> um, from actually, uh, from Robert's book, um, he, he talks about, uh, and this is from actually Patanjali's yoga system. I mean, that's his tradition. Uh, it teaches that each intentional act creates a karmic residue which will conform either to dharma or a dharma. Each residue has various dispositional traces, which are called samskaras, which produce numerous results, including two types of residual impressions called vasanas, while one sort of residual impression stores the memory of the act, the other produces the affliction 
these usually erroneous conceptions causes people to remain in bondage to their karmas by spurring them to create yet further karmic residue. Even the memory of a partial incarnation can fasten you more firmly to error if you cannot digest the experiences you had, which is why nature ordinarily will not permit you this to remember your past lives until you're in no j- danger of being overwhelmed by them, which is nobody except uh, the Neem Karoli Baba, perhaps, a Buddha. That's it. Um, but the subtlety of what we create here uh, in, t- in terms of the complexity by which these actions, thoughts, uh, act as a continuum to support these habitual patterns and tendi- mm-hmm, uh, tendencies. Mm-hmm. So uh, how, how, how? <laughs> how do we deal with that? How do we deal with that? Well, I think, you know, um, there's a, a, a way of looking at it that's kind of exciting because you see that, and basically what he's talking about is just habit formation, you know? Like if you... Mm get in the habit of being angry, it's that much easier to be angry, you know? But it's not like it's written in stone. It doesn't mean you have to be exactly the same person next year you are this year. Um, in fact, it's unlikely that you will be. So uh, it's it's realizing that every time you also step back, you're creating a consequence, you know? Like um, one c- kind of quirky teaching of the Buddhas is if you do something knowing that it's wrong, that's a better karmic result than not even knowing it was wrong. Cause, and that's different from how most of us were raised, right? Like you knew better and because you knew better, it was that much worse, you know? And, but basically it's a very common sense kind of thing. What the Buddha is saying is if you're acting from greed or you're acting from hatred or you're acting from fear and you had ignorance on top of that, that's not that good, you know? Whereas if you kind of know oh, this is, this is sort of crummy. You like you go for it inside yourself and then you pull back and then you go for it inside yourself and then you pull back and then you finally lose it and you just go for it and you do it. You know, all those moments of pulling back, they count too. You know, and, and so that gets easier mm. and easier mm. as, as time goes on. And so uh, we have to learn also to give ourselves a break. It's not that easy to change a habit or... You know, maybe it's a lifetime's worth of conditioning uh, toward a certain end or, you know, way of being. But, you know, with that kind of persistence, it's it really does work. Yeah. Boy, when you start to think of these things and the, the creation of them over, over lifetimes, which is really, uh, of course, very, very difficult to apprehend. Uh, to to really come to a, a, the kind of understanding that can help you actually change stuff, so you, you more or less are dealing with where you are now, which is again part of the getting real thing, as far as I'm concerned. Mm-hmm. It's just you know, be honest. Where are we right now? And but to understand the somewhat the law of karma, that uh, the subtlety of what we create, and that these habitual patterns are reinforced by these by the creation of our minds is, uh, I think, really important. Um, he talks about, Robert, actually, awareness as a karma-producing activity. Um, he said, even awareness itself is karma-producing activity. When your self-identification, the force which self-identifies, identifies with it, inaccurate perceptions encourage tighter bondage, proper perce- perception promotes freedom. So yeah, let's talk about the the yeah, the, the self identification with awareness because I think that that is one of the most critical issues around the whole the, what's becoming such a the a common common expression. It's become too common mindfulness in our culture at this point. And I think that, uh, would, and mindfulness, certainly awareness is at the core of mindfulness practice. And when I read this, I, I started to think about yeah, how we, we bypass getting real uh, with uh, self-identification. Well, you know, like mindfulness has a lot of different meanings anyway, classically, but it's certainly used in a lot of different ways um, nowadays. And... Some of those ways are probably pretty superficial. Some of them are kind of the same thing as loving awareness or the same as getting real. 
um, because mindfulness isn't determined by what you're looking at. It's determined by how you are with what you're looking at, you know, so they're just inevitable times. Well, it's everything, you know, it's challenging. They're inevitable times in practice, a meditation practice where you just feel so exhilarated and opened up and amazing, you know, and, and then we cling. We think, oh, that's going to last forever good. You know, and the next thing we know, it's gone and we're devastated. And um, we have really painful experiences sometimes, painful memories or uh, painful understandings, you know, like, no, that's never going to happen, actually. They're not coming back or whatever it is, you know. And painful, you know, people say constantly, I never knew how clinging I was till I began meditating, you know. I never knew how angry I was before I began meditating. It's just, uh, you know, it's that kind of clearer, cleaner look at, oh, yeah, that's that's actually going on. Um, but, you know, the Buddha said something really beautiful once. He said, um, if you truly loved yourself, you'd never harm another. Mm. Wow. And, you know, if you truly loved yourself, you'd never harm another. So I think sometimes what happens is we sort of see these ways we've harmed somebody. We said something or was really hurtful or, or whatever, we feel the lack of love for ourselves right there, and it's very painful. Uh, and also I think part of that is the understanding that we can live in a bigger way than just being mediocre or getting by. We're Actually, each of us is really capable of tremendous love and compassion and presence and wisdom, but we don't nearly approach that capacity. Um, and for people or ourselves at different times to make choices that actually set us back. You know, it's a sad, poignant thing. It's not like a horrible thing or an evil thing. It's it's pretty poignant. And so we can have a lot of compassion for ourselves as we realize, like, yeah, blew it, you know, let's start over. And we can have compassion for others as well, uh, which is a very different way of relating than a kind of moralistic, repressive, um, angry tone, you know, like... Uh, the worst person who ever lived kind of feeling, which d doesn't lead anywhere, you know, it's just not a skillful way of being. Mm. Um, let's get back to the, but the, the self-identification with awareness, and I mm -hmm. guess that we're really talking about that, uh, for instance, Ram Dass has over the years, when he first came back from India, a big thing of his as a, method was witness mm -hmm. and and he would talk about we're not talking about witnessing from mind we're not talking mm -hmm. about witnessing from that I place from which we think about stuff and act from that mm -hmm. place we're talking mm -hmm. about and as he says it now we're uh, moving into the center of your being into a, a spiritual heart mm -hmm. loving awareness spot from that's the only place you can have this kind of awareness how how mm -hmm. how would you speak of it in in, in terms of uh, in buddhist terms of getting well, i know that's kind of what we call mindfulness actually. Yeah, yeah really <laughs> that you're coming <laughs> right but it's um yeah it's not i mean i know in the 60s and 70s uh we used to talk uh, about the witness a lot now days it's more like witnessing it's a process it's not like a, mm -hmm. a secret place. part of your mind you yeah. know like um and it is a place that's not drawing conclusions and it's not lost in story and it's it's open-hearted uh and is is very present and it's you know it's it's a cultivation it's a skill you know i mean i think that's part of what makes people frustrated is because they have the idea, or we can have the idea that um, you got it or you don't, you know. And if you're, you know, middle aged and you don't got it, you're never going to get it. And it's just not conceived that way, you know. We can cultivate mindfulness, we can cultivate balance, we can cultivate love, we can cultivate compassion, because uh, so much of those qualities depend on how we're paying attention. You know, it's like if you're not listening to someone you're talking to and your mind is a million miles away, there's not going to be a feeling of connection. And so there's not going to be that sense of love or compassion. But all you have to do is shift how you're paying attention. 
right, and more fully arrive and actually take them in. And then there is the sense of connection, and then the rest can emerge. And so, um, you know, I love having the sense of a path. First of all, it's something to do <laughs> all day. Um, <laughs> And, uh, As Chrisida uh, says, instead of watching TV <laughs> or Game TV, of Thrones. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, exactly. You know, I've never seen Game of Thrones. But, uh, <laughs> you know, there's, uh, there's this, I guess I'm the kind of person who's very supported by structure. Mm. You know, and not everybody is, I'm sure. But, you know, for me to say, okay, I'm going to make the experiment. And it's all in the flavor of an experiment of doing three generous things today. And they don't have to be material generosity. You know, it could be energetic. It could be listening to somebody or thanking somebody or something like that. But Or it could be material generosity, whatever. And just see what it feels like, you know, not because I'm, I'm being prudish or trying to prove I'm superior to anybody else, but what does it feel like? And just keep paying attention. Or I'm going to look for three things I can be grateful for today. Uh, and notice, oh, what does that feel like? And then there's the usual run of just complaining all the time. What does that feel like? Mm, mm. You know, and and then we know for ourselves, like, oh yeah, this is this is something different in, in terms of a way of being, and and it's possible. You just got to put it into practice and put it into practice and put it into practice, and and your whole life shifts around. Right, and this is this is the kind of right action that we were talking about before that can turn karmic uh, proclivities into a positive uh, mm -hmm. outcome. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And and everybody out there, you know, because everybody's talking about, okay, what do we do? What do we do? We hear you, but what do we do? Well, here's, here's uh, some advice that's not even advice. It's, it's Sharon saying, take a risk for a moment and do something out of your wheelhouse. Yeah. Like, oh, I never thought... I would ever, I would never think of doing three generous acts today. That's not my makeup. Well, this is part of changing the patterns is to take a risk and do something perhaps that you might not have done. And just going back to uh, awareness, what I, th I think the key is and, and how you've uh, explained it is in the key is love and compassion. Mm -hmm. So that everything that you are aware of what's going on in your mind what's going on in your actions what's going on in your motivations as soon as you realize that it's coming from an open-hearted place that's why i guess ramdas is loving awareness yeah, loving awareness good. is a yeah. great is a great term which you all have taken that over by the way i noticed well, that I noticed jack some of us have jack was taken <laughs> over i've noticed that <laughs> It's trademark, but it's okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm protecting Ram Dass's trademark. Uh, but that is, it's, it's a great expression. It really does say, okay, that's getting real, is when that is uh, available and um, present in awareness. That, uh, you know, that's really important. Uh, another thing that's, I'm not sure how you would characterize it. We've talked about this before. Uh, the essence of living with reality, uh, this is another thing from Robert Subaboda, is to continually surrender to what is. And I, uh, we had a whole thing uh, a couple of years ago, uh, and I believe you were with us when K.K. Shaw was here, uh, and he talked about the Indian term for sh surrender, which is a sharanagat. And he said, when I first brought it up with him, he said, you know, you people in the West, you have no idea. You think surrender is giving up stuff, like your money, like your, your house, like your identity. You know, this has nothing to do with surrender. And he, we went through a whole thing around true surrender, which is the ultimate offering to the, to the divine, basically. Uh, and uh, but I think in in more practical getting real, quote unquote, terms, uh, I think the part of surrender that is letting go of the negative and letting go of 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 that which is uh, impeding open heartedness. Imp mm -hmm. and, and it again, back to karma, it has to do 
with uh, 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 doing the the kind of actions which change the mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the habitual patterns that go on to create mm-hmm. real mm-hmm. misery for people. So mm-hmm. how how would you uh, characterize that in terms of uh, mm-hmm. Buddhist thought around surrender and? Yeah, well, I think some of, a lot of it comes back to wisdom, you know, mm. because uh, we believe so many things, and um, most of them are probably untrue, you know. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, uh, so for example, many people get a very perfectionistic set of standards, and so they're never happy with themselves. You know, it's never good enough. We're never good enough, and and uh, it's endless. <laughs> And we think that's the way to make progress. That's the way to um, step out of our comfort zone. That's the way to test ourselves. It's the way uh, we're going to get something done. But uh, it seems pretty clear from people's experience and now from more and more research that it doesn't work that well. First of all, nothing in nature is perfect, right? Nothing in life is perfect. Like I just got a new car a little while ago. It wasn't perfect, you know. Once the first bird pooped on it, which happened, you know, and I was really <laughs> resentful. I thought, wait a minute, you know, it's like not time yet. Or, you know, a million years ago when Joseph and I built the duplex that, that we live in in Barry, uh, I mean, there was a mar on the wall within like a second and a half. You think, wait a minute, couldn't this just have been perfect for a little while? Like, you know, nothing is static, so nothing is frozen in that kind of perfection. So what is it we actually want, you know? And, um, and people are so unkind to themselves mm. in, in pursuit of that perfection. And uh, that's why people, even with languaging, you know, people say to me all the time things like, uh, like at the end of a retreat, like how can I keep the level of mindfulness I cultivated here? Or how can I stay concentrated all day long at work? And in each case I say, that's not going to happen. <laughs> You're not going to keep something and you're not going to stay. You know, nothing's going to maintain, but you're going to learn how to come back sooner and sooner. You're going to learn how to begin again better. Uh, You know, that's what's actually going to happen. That's what's real. But some imagined standard where your mind's never going to wander again, that is not going to happen. You know, and, and people get on themselves so badly. Like, why can't I, you know, have a blank mind like no doubt everyone else has? Or, <laughs> Or whatever it is. And so uh, wisdom is kind of important, I think, in terms of knowing how a path unfolds and what to expect and what's just those old, old tapes in our heads saying, you know, you've got to do better. It'll never be good enough. And and realize that's just a story. Talking about stories, you know, that's really a story. Um, Given the capacity of the human mind and the human heart to understand and to heal and to love and you know so we we have to catch that story and realize that's not that's like not a viable path it's a very deceptive i don't know it's like being out um in the snow and if you're driving you know and and uh you end up on a detour that goes nowhere i don't know if that's ever happened to you you know i have had that experience uh you know because some we go a little further down that detour road and the wa- and the wires are down or, you know, a tree fell or something like that. And you think, well, you got to turn around. That's not a, that's not a useful path. Mm. Surrender. 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 Yeah. I, I hadn't thought of it in the way. The wisdom, the surrender is, is totally under the aegis of wisdom <laughs> that you get to the point where, yeah, okay, you got to turn around. So you yeah. let go into that, surrender to yeah. that. You're not going to yeah. try and, you know, drive around it and get stuck in the snow. That's happened to me, okay, trying to do something like that and got myself into worse trouble because I was mm-hmm. going to use my will. rather. You know, and yeah. that happens yeah. to us all the time. So yeah. there's, a, there's a real wisdom in letting go in, into the moment and realizing, okay, let's get, get mm-hmm. getting real here. We got to mm-hmm. turn around. So. I love that. Is that a book title? Getting real. I have a well. I have real. No, it's all yours. Real so you, work and I have real you, love. And like, yeah, you have real love. By the way, <laughs> out there, love. everybody, 
This is uh, this is book only came out, uh, you know, six months ago or something, and it's a fantastic book. So pick that up, okay? Real love from Sharon. And when we're talking, well, we're talking about getting real, but I expect your next book is going to be called Getting Real, okay? That is a very interesting point, which I have not thought of once before this conversation. <laughs> yeah, well, but maybe. <laughs> maybe. Um, I want to talk about Dharma, you know, because that's another misinterpreted <laughs> kind of term, and. Uh, let me just say what uh, Robert talks about Dharma, which uh, people uh, mistranslate as duty and or others as religion and others as vocation. Uh, and he says it's really what doing what you are born to do. Conforming to your Dharma means following that path through life and performing those actions that best agree with you as an individual in the context of the environment in which you exist. Dharma is the universal law which makes a thing what it is. The Dharma of the moon to shine, of volcanoes to erupt, of boats to float, and of hyenas to laugh. Horses run, whinny, and toss their manes because it is their Dharma to do so, not because they feel any moral obligation mm -hmm. in that direction. I mean, great stuff, right? A Dharma is neither sin nor evil. It is simply nonconformity with the nature of things, a crime against harmony. I mean, I mm -hmm. think that's a great uh, interpretation, but I, I think for us to to move into yeah. how this can be useful under our getting real uh, using uh, yeah. this kind of wisdom. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I mean, by the time, my understanding is that by the time the Buddha came around, you know, mm. the last Buddha, um, a lot of that meaning of dharma that you just read had been corrupted by its association with the caste system. Uh, so it was like the dharma of Brahmin males to study scripture and mediate with divine forces, whereas that was considered completely wrong for Brahmin females mm. or for people from another caste. And it was the dharma of, you know, other people to be warriors or to be servants or whatever. And um, and so morality was resting a lot on whether you conform to your caste. And the Buddha came along and said, none of that is true. That, you know, nobility doesn't come from being born. And therefore, the association, you know, given India, that it's not about skin color, right? Um, nobility comes from the intention. It comes from your actions. It comes from how you behave. And the karma is from your intentions. And so he kind of tied that use of dharma to one's own intentions mm. you know and and that was sort of a revolution in his time it was like a social revolution in his time because you know Brahmin males were pretty comfortable mediating with divine forces and yeah. other people had gotten used to not having a chance to practice a liberating path for example you know because they were sweeping or whatever um you know and the buddha came around and said it's irrelevant it has nothing to do with the truth of liberation and so uh that's why dharma more means like the path within the buddhist context you know it's um the teachings the nature of things the truth of things another meaning of dharma is that which supports you mm. you know what will really oppose you so what robert is saying so beautifully is um i mean if you totally take it away from that historical association of the caste system uh if you're living in touch with some authentic part of yourself um, and uh, it's toward the good, you know, you can be authentically hostile too, you know, so it's <laughs> not that. Uh, we you have know, some of that going on too. You know, if you live in, in touch with, um, you know, some manifestation, like, some people are very artistic, you know, and, and their revolutionary action is going to be, you know, theater or poetry or something like that. Other people are this way or that way or whatever. Um, you know, we can be in touch with proclivities. We can be in touch with our nature uh, to be outgoing, to be introverted, whatever it is. Um, but if the most important thing to be in touch with is like what is good heartedness, you know, it's kindness, it's generosity, it's presence, it's caring, it's compassion. You know, that's what's onward leading, how, however you were sort of trained or born or whatever. Right. 
Yes, that's our collective dharma. It really, and the mm. more we can identify with that, especially in the world we're living in today, then we can ha stand a chance at making some contribution of of uh, of a positive nature. Uh, Joseph talks about coming to an understanding of karma. Uh, understanding of karma is the basis for a very straightforward development of the wisdom to know whether our actions will lead to happiness and freedom or to further suffering. Mm -hmm. When we understand this, it allows us to take responsibility for past actions with an attitude of compassion, appreciating that a particular act may have been unwholesome or harmful and strongly determining not to repeat it. Guilt is a manifestation of condemnation, wisdom, an expression of sensitivity and forgiveness. I think God knows that's that's so super important, right? I mean, um, yeah. You guys are Definitely. good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which brings us uh, w again when we talk about getting real, and and the intricacies of understanding karma and what we create. And uh, I, I think that that understanding will help us on a day to day basis mm -hmm. just to sit, as you said, sit and get real. And I think that means having a true awareness, loving awareness. Mm -hmm. It means understanding you can return in as as was as Joseph just said in here, whatever uh, you, you know, unwholesome or harmful things that you know have happened that c you've created and your strong determination not to continue to create that goes a long way and that sitting around thinking yourself as a you know a piece of shit i did that, you know is not That's right. useful That's right. and we all do it yeah. so uh you know i think these things uh, i'm really happy to be talking to you guys all of you uh, all of our friends from you know these decades of, uh, centered around our relationship with Ramdas. Uh, I think it's really important in terms of getting to that place where we can surrender to what is and be mm -hmm. here now. Really, <laughs> this is what it is. Thank you, Sharon. This has been uh, every time I get with you, I'm like, well. Why haven't I seen you in so long? Because you're know, so darn busy. Long. That's why. Well, that's true. Well, come come up, come to New York or Massachusetts. And it's yeah. a little colder. I'm going I don't to know Massachusetts. how much you enjoy that. <laughs> yeah, right. I will be coming, and I will absolutely, we will, shall get together. Okay. Uh, but uh, for those of you who want to plan for the future, Sharon will be with us uh, in, in Maui uh, at the end of this year, uh, the Wednesday after Thanksgiving, whatever that is. Uh, and this is our first announcement about that, by the way, and it's way off, and you can't register for it yet, not until, I think, uh, end of May or something. Oh. Uh, we will be uh, with uh, her uh, cohorts, Jack Cornfield and Joseph Goldstein, all in one spot, everybody. So that's like a thrill that we're going to have. Uh, and uh, so I'm really looking forward. But I'm going to see you way before that, and I really want to thank mm -hmm. you for for joining me today and continuing this conversation about getting real and i expect that book will uh, should be written and should come out next year <laughs> <laughs> all right i gotta go write the proposal sorry yeah, right. <laughs> all right this is mind rolling ragu with sharon and on the be here now network and sharon's podcast is available there as well so please go to be here now network.com and uh, we shall see you next week namaste